All right, we're going to start our discussion of management. Uh, we're going to go over uh, really the role of management and why is it important to organizational success. Uh, we're going to spend some time discussing the management process, some of the different basic management skills uh, that are required of managers in order to actually be successful. And then we're going to spend some time discussing contingency planning and some of the different types of management as well as areas of management here. Uh, first thing and one of the most important things is the management process. Uh, it consists of four steps that are basically part of this particular process and they are planning, organizing, leading, as well as controlling. And managers do these uh, in conjunction with one another in order to increase the organizational success, organization's success. And they are done in sequence of one another, starting with the planning process specifically, which we'll get into in a little more detail shortly. But first, let's take a look at the hierarchy of management. There are several roles, essentially, or types of managers, I should say, uh, that are involved in the organizational hierarchy. Uh, the first you start with is top management. Uh, now, one thing I will mention before I go first is that managers at all levels take, pl take part of the management process. They are involved in the management process, specifically the planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. However, what I will say is that they do so in varying degrees. Uh, so for a someone who's a top manager, they're obviously responsible for the firm's overall performance. These are your CEOs, your chief executive officers, your CFOs or chief financial officers, your presidents, vice presidents, people with high ranking positions that have a lot of authority. And with that authority, they tend to dictate policy for the company and control the direction for the company. CEOs specifically are in charge of articulating vision for their particular companies. Steve Jobs, former CEO of Apple, was in charge of articulating a vision for his company. What direction were they going to take? They also need to establish priorities. When you're in any type of management role, whether or not you're in the first line area or you're a top manager, you know that you have competing priorities. What you do or what you spend your time on directly affects your ability to spend time somewhere else. And so how do you balance those competing interests? Well, establishing priorities, focusing on what is truly the most important, what you can do over someone else, what you can do the best that no one else can do, and making that a priority. Top managers are also in charge of allocating resources. They obviously have to determine what money is going to be allocated to research and development, to marketing specifically, to developing new products, to customer service, and all those different types of things. And obviously it's very important that you allocate your resources in a manner that is going to help the company become profitable or remain profitable. And next you have middle management, the center area here. Uh, middle management is primarily kind of a liaison between top management and first line management. They need to have great communication skills because not only are you dealing with top management, but you're also dealing with your first line managers. And the communication that takes place isn't necessarily going to be the same. When I was in middle management, I was given the task of disseminating information to my first line managers as we're calling them right now. And it was important that I learned how to interact with those particular types of managers because they're different demographics, right? You're dealing with different age groups for one, different experience levels, different levels of income, different levels of education. And the way that you communicate with one group isn't necessarily the way that you would communicate with another. And so you need to understand how to tailor your communication style ultimately to that particular employee. And that's really a primary task of middle management. They facilitate a great deal of communication, being kind of the uh, liaison, so to speak, and passing down information, but also passing up information from first line managers. Uh, next, you have your first line managers, of course, and these are the, one, the people that are going to be directly supervising the employees that are doing the actual work. Um, they could vary in terms of position or title, can be a supervisor, 
possibly an office manager, maybe a store manager at certain stores that are considered to be more, uh, much smaller that have direct involvement. Obviously, larger stores, your targets and your best buys, you know, there are managers kind of in between as well. Uh, also could take the, pl- take the form of a team leader. Um, which a lot of companies refer to that terminology with regards to titles. And first line managers are very important because you're supervising the people that are doing the work. You primarily are in charge of training new employees that come on board and motivating them because you have direct contact with them on a very frequent basis and then also evaluating their performance. You know, whether it's on a monthly basis, semi-annual, or an annual basis. There needs to be some objective way that you can actually evaluate your employees to determine if they're doing a good job. So the roles of these managers, depending upon what level that they're in, require different skill sets, of course. And so what you need for a first-line manager isn't necessarily the same skills that you would need for top management. You know, a lot of people in companies that I've worked for previously have always said, well, our top managers don't understand the technical aspects of the work, you know, how we actually do specifically this work. They lack an understanding of it. They can't do it if we ask them to. And there is some validity to that. But I would argue that that isn't a primary skill that needs to be possessed by top management. It isn't necessarily important that they can do the technical work. Uh, It's helpful if they understand it, right? So they know what's reasonable and what's not. But in terms of actually engaging in the technical type work, like running a cash register or producing something physically, they don't necessarily need to know that because they're not involved with it on a day-to-day basis. They need different skills. And so it's important to recognize that depending upon which level a manager lies, they will need different types of skills. So let's talk about some of those skills here real quick. Uh, There are five primary skills. There are three listed here. uh, Two I will go over that aren't necessarily in this slide deck here. Uh, First of which is what I mentioned before, technical skills. Technical skills are the skills needed to perform a specialized task. Running a cash register, data entry, utilizing a specific type of software are all examples of technical skills type skills. And these are very, very important. These are very important, obviously, for the people that are doing the specific work. If I'm uh, running a cash register at Target, it's important that I understand how to operate that particular piece of machinery, right? If I'm a computer programmer, it's important that I know how to write certain types of code. Those are very imperative to my success in the position. What they're also important to is the success of the first line manager. Because remember, as a first line manager, you're the one who's actually supervising the people that are doing the work. And so it's important that you understand what good quality work looks like, what a successful product looks like. If you don't, then you have really no basis for comparison. You have no ability to be objective and really evaluate someone's performance. On top of that, Your first line managers are typically the people that are actually training new employees. And so if you don't understand the inner workings of the process yourself, how do you expect to be able to train someone and give them the skills that they need to be successful in their particular job? So technical skills are the most important type of skills for first line managers. It's very, very important because they're in charge of training, they're in charge of development, in charge of evaluating employees based upon those skills. Uh, Next you have human relations skills. Human relations skills are skills that help managers understand and relate to employees. These are important at all levels, obviously, because managers are all going to interact with employees. Uh, In my opinion, human human relations skills or human skills are most important at the middle management level. And the reason being, as I mentioned this before, is in in a middle management level, you are working with multiple different people from multiple different backgrounds. So your ability to communicate in a way that's tailored to that group is very, very 
important. As a top level manager, you're primarily communicating with people are similar to you, and then obviously people at the middle management level. You aren't communicating a great deal with your first line manager, so you don't have to necessarily adapt to a great degree. In middle management, you're communicating with really everyone. So it's important that you have a complementary type of skills with regards to communication if you're gonna be able to be effective and ultimately kind of gain those relationships and that trust with different types of groups. You have to know what to emphasize with certain groups. How do I communicate? How do I speak to certain groups? What's the terminology that they use? And how do you relate to them if you're ultimately going to motivate them and work with them? It's very, very important. Uh, third are conceptual skills. Uh, conceptual skills allow a manager to see ultimately the big picture. They allow them to diagnose and analyze different situations to determine ultimately what the potential impact could be. Conceptual skills, as you've probably already gathered, are the most important for your, your top managers, your high-ranking managers, because their decisions are the ones that affect the performance of the company. Depending upon what direction they take an actual company that could have positive or negative ramifications for the future success of that firm. And so these are definitely the most important for your top level managers that are in those particular positions here. It's very important that they can diagnose a situation. And a lot of this comes from experience, right? The more and more times that you make decisions and see the outcomes of those results, the better you get at making decisions because you have some context to it, because you've seen how it, how it plays out. You don't necessarily have to let it play out to figure out what's gonna happen, you know. You develop that kind of intuition, so to speak, which only comes with making decisions and then ultimately seeing the end result. Now, two more skills that I will add to this, of course, uh, one of which is decision-making skills. Uh, decision-making skills are the skills that allow managers to accurately define problems. Okay, So skills that allow managers to accurately design, define problems, but not only that, but also allow them to select the best course of action. Right? There are specific steps that are involved in the decision-making process. First thing you need to do is you need to gather all the relevant facts, determine what truly is relevant to this situation that would impact my particular decision. You have to identify all of the solutions involved. Right? What are all of the possible solutions that could solve my particular problem? You have to evaluate alternatives. That's step three. You have to, obviously, each of the options isn't necessarily as good or as bad as the other. They all have positives and negatives, and you have to weigh and do kind of a cost-benefit analysis and figure out which one of those is going to be the best for you. And lastly, you have to implement that chosen alternative. That kind of walks you through the decision-making process as well. But managers obviously utilize decision-making skills in various degrees, but the impact of them is more significant than others. And obviously, if you're in a top management role, your decisions have a drastic effect on the company and of a lot of people. If you're in a first-line management role, maybe your decisions impact your work group, the people that report to you, your direct reports, but they don't necessarily have a trickle-down effect or don't affect multiple different areas. Uh, fifth skill that I'll mention here, and we'll kind of sum this up, are time management skills, right? Time management skills allow us to be productive with our time. We have competing interests, as I mentioned before. You know, the time that you spend doing something is time that you basically have to forfeit in doing something else. It's called an opportunity cost in accounting. And so if I spend time on something, I'm affecting multiple different things. And especially as we continue to get uh, more to a higher level in management, it's important that you can employ effective time management skills. You know, I read uh, a recent article in the Wall Street Journal that talked about how, how a CEO spends his time. And so a, a company basically took a look at uh, CEOs and how they spend their time. They coordinated with all of the executive assistants of CEOs from Fortune 500 companies, and they got work logs in basically telling uh, them how they spent their time. And out of a typical 55, 60 hour work week, about a third of that was spent in meetings, uh, which is very time consuming, right? And most of us don't like meetings. We think they're not very 
uh, effective and they don't produce very fruitful results. Imagine spending a third of your work week in meetings all day. And maybe you do, and I feel bad for you, but obviously those are very time consuming. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork. That obviously wastes a lot of time. Uh, you have, uh, you know, obviously different competing interests like phone calls and, and emails, and those are all things that are huge time sucks. And how do we manage our way kind of through that territory and figure out what truly is the most important thing that we can do? Uh, one thing that's always fun to mention is there are a lot of things that come out as new ways of assessing managers and assessing whether or not they're going to be a high performing manager in an organization. And what they do now are a lot of uh, in basket assessment center tests. And what those are is they try to give managers or applicants, right, if you're applying for a management role, the most realistic job preview possible. And so they set you up in a controlled environment and giving you uh, multiple things that you have to manage within a brief moment in time. And then they basically grade you on how well you were, able to, you, how well you were able to prioritize all of the competing interests, everything from responding to memos, to emails, to determining budget meetings, what to say. Uh, I myself participated in a, one of these particular assessment centers and they are very nerve wracking because you have a, a small amount of time and you have to do multiple different things. At one point I had to uh, actually uh, uh, proctor or moderate a particular meeting about globalization and expanding into a particular country. I had to prioritize a bunch of different memos and emails and find out who to respond to and what to say. I had to give a presentation about something and it's all within about a two hour time period. And then you get graded based upon what you're able to do, you know, from the effectiveness of your communication, from your prioritizing abilities and all those different things. And so it's very, very difficult to do, but organizations are finding that if I'm going to pay a significant amount of money putting someone on my payroll, and then obviously having to give you a certain period of time so you're up and running effectively, and I'm going to pay you benefits and all these different perks, I want to make sure I'm making a good decision. So why not put you in a similar environment to what you would be experiencing uh, when you're actually working on the job? And this is very, very important because if you think about it, a lot of times we hire people to management roles because they were really good at a technical task. And as you've probably seen in your workplace, people that are really good at a technical task aren't necessarily good managers. But we, that's the only thing that we have to gauge it off of, right? You perform well doing this. I'm going to promote you to a position of authority. And now I've lost my best person here and I have a really crummy manager. And that's what often happens. So you're seeing employers kind of be a little more creative in how they assess managers and in, in ways that they can tell if they're going to be strong performing applicants. All right, let's go ahead and walk you through a little bit of the planning process that we talked about or at least alluded to at the top of the at the top of the uh, lecture here. Um, now, obviously, the planning process is important because an organization is trying to determine what it needs to do and how best to ultimately do that, right? It's a very core function to management. It's very important because how you plan will dictate the rest of the activities that the company actually engages in, right? How do we plan for competition that's coming in? You know, what, what are our strategies that we develop from that? How do you plan for the economic uncertainty? You know, obviously with the recession in 2008, there was a great deal of economic uncertainty. Consumer spending was low because we had just massive unemployment at that point in time. And so how as an organization do I plan to still run my business successfully, but take into consideration the fact that people aren't spending as much money, maybe the product that I sell is not considered to be a necessity, so as a result, I take a huge hit. These are all things and all questions that you ask in the actual planning process. It's very, very crucial. Uh, specifically, there are different stages of planning. Um, you have your strategic planning area, which is typically done by senior management. Um, strategic planning is higher level, obviously. You're talking about strategies, ultimately, that will lead to the success of the company. You know, main overarching strategies could be the decision to outsource labor in certain areas. Obviously, there's a huge cost advantage if you were to outsource your manufacturing facilities over in China. 
But at the same time, you're probably going to get a lot of pushback in the U.S. for offshoring and sending jobs outside of our borders here. Strategic planning encompasses acquiring new companies. If there's a particular company that maybe has a type of technology that you think can be beneficial to your firm, maybe it's a good advantage or maybe it's a good idea to acquire that company and get that technology, even though maybe they don't have everything that you want, but you're really after one set of technology. That's very prominent in the technology sector, right? You have companies like Google and Apple that will pay billions of dollars to acquire certain types of technology so it can't be necessarily used against them in the open market by a competitor. Your tactical planning is primarily done by middle management. Once the company or once the senior management, that top management level agrees on a particular strategy, they kind of uh, pass that down to middle manager to develop the actual tactics to get the job done, right? These specifics. Um, these could be things more along the lines of investing in new equipment, spending advertising dollars in, in different areas. Now, obviously, things that don't necessarily impact the firm as significantly as what senior management does, but they're still involved in a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the, the planning process. One thing about tactical planning is it's typically more short term. You know, we're talking about implementing specific plans that go in line with strategic plans. They need to be obviously consistent with one another. You don't want counterproductive planning, but they typically are shorter term for implementing those types of plans. Uh, last one is operational planning, and that's engaged in by your first line management. Obviously, first line managers, the decisions that they make really only affect you know, the people they come into contact with, specifically direct reports, customers. And these are very short-term plans that usually are in line with daily, weekly, or even monthly performance, so to speak. And these could be things such as how to schedule certain employees, depending upon what the demand is. Um, this is very big, obviously, in retail, which is predominantly uh, more of a seasonal type business if you sell seasonal type products. So obviously, you have to decide who to staff and where during those peak times uh, so that you don't potentially eliminate sales. Um, obviously, how to greet customers, the processes that go into place. You know, research proves that if customers are greeted and welcomed at the door, they are much more likely to actually purchase products there at that particular establishment, which is why you see a lot of retailers go to great lengths to make sure and acknowledge customers as they come through the door. Now, one thing I want to talk about here real quick is contingency planning. Uh, contingency planning is done for a number of different reasons, but as we know, with, there's a lot of uncertainty in the open markets, and contingency planning allows companies to identify important aspects of their business that may end up changing at some point and developing a plan for how to respond to that particular change. You're trying to plan for the unknown. Although we can't necessarily impact or affect what happens to us, we can have a plan in place for what happens, right? It's kind of the whole idea with having a you know fire procedure for your own homes, obviously, and that all of your family is aware of what to do when there's a fire, what exits to go down, where to meet up afterwards, who to call. You do, wouldn't necessarily want a fire to happen, right? That would be ridiculous. Uh, and you don't, can't, you can't predict when it will happen. But if it does, you have a plan in place how to deal with it. That's the that's a primary example of contingency planning. And this can take a number of different forms, as you can see here on your screen. Obviously, you know, responding to competitors if they have the ability to outsell our products. What do we do? What do we do if a government regulates our particular industry? Um, Google had to kind of go down this road, obviously, as it was trying to get its search engine into China specifically, because as we know, China has a planned economy. They control and censor the information that their citizens hear. So obviously, they didn't want Google providing access to information that their people, they didn't want to hear. They like to control those things. They have state-run media because they want to control what goes into their citizens' heads so they don't necessarily go through and you know revolt if they realize how bad they actually have. Have it. You know, it's kind of what started the uh, uprising in the Middle East with Egypt and Libya and some of those other areas is they had access to information and found out that, hey, we're not tr people other places of the world aren't really treated like the way we are. This is kind of odd. 
Um, so that's kind of the primary purpose there. You know, how do you respond when a computer system goes down? Uh, responding for natural disasters is very significant, or responding to terrorist attacks. You know, Apple obviously had to go through its uh, contingency planning process when Steve Jobs obviously became sick, um, you know, several, several years ago. And they had to determine, you know, what happens here? We have someone who is considered to be the face of our company, whose vision has really gotten us to this point in terms of seeing the types of products that consumer was going consumers were going to want. What do we do when he is no longer here? Because there is going to be a day eventually when he isn't going to be at the head of this company, at the helm, so to speak. And Apple took a lot of criticism because they weren't necessarily transparent with what they were doing, right? Investors were very critical saying, we want to know what your contingency plan is if we are going to invest in your company. And they kept everything very, very close to the chest, so to speak. Now, obviously they were planning but the board wasn't releasing you know, what they were saying, who they were considering, which obviously we know is Tim Cook now, who was the COO at the point in time. Um, but contingency planning is important, and companies engage in it in all levels, ultimately. Because like I said before, although you can't affect what happens to you, you can have a plan in place to ultimately help how you respond to that particular situation. Now let's look at kind of how to contingency plan. How do you focus on, you know, what, what's the most important thing to do? Um, there's a contingency planning paradigm that most businesses focus on here. And what they try to do is focus on the issues that are most likely going to occur and could potentially have the most harmful impact on the company. Right? There are very, very harmful issues that could happen to a company, right? 2012 hits and the entire world, you know, is in mass destruction and all that kind of stuff. That's a very, very harmful issue, right? The probability, though, of that actually happening is very slim. Okay, so you wouldn't necessarily contingency plan for something like that. You know, it's funny, if you were to go on the CDC, the Center for Disease Control's website, um, there is the potential for a, they have a plan in place for a zombie apocalypse, right? We've seen that zombie movies have been very, very popular and sell very well. Uh, Walking Dead, I believe, which is a popular uh, TV show. I'm not sure on what it airs, but I know it's very, very popular and it's about zombies. And so they have a plan in place, which I think is a little bit of a gimmick, um, for a zombie apocalypse. Now, would you plan for that as a business on what to do? Very, very harmful issue, obviously, right? If people become zombies because they probably lose their ability to think and they probably don't buy your products, I'm assuming. Um, I don't know because I haven't experienced it, but I'm assuming that, right? That's an assumption on my part. And so, but is it probable? Is it likely to happen? I don't want to focus on that because the chances of it happening are probably slim to none, right? I, I could have to take back what I say if it does happen, uh, but we'll, we'll wait and see, kind of. So as a company, you want to focus on things that can, are the most harmful to your company, the most harmful to your business, and have the highest probability of actually taking place. Right? Apple, for example, a new CEO not having Steve Jobs in the picture was extremely harmful to the company because he was the directional leader of that company. And it had a high probability of happening, right? In 2007, he had to take some time off because he had that liver transplant. So they knew he wasn't in the best health at that point in time. And so given that it is a high probability, given that it's very harmful to the future success of the company, that is going to be something that we focus on. Now let's walk you through some steps in the strategic planning process here. Uh, first thing that needs to be done obviously defining what the mission is for your particular company. Most major companies, um, in fact, all major companies have mission statements, kind of those guiding principles, the things that affect the decisions that they make, the products they produce, the people that they serve, and how they serve them. Uh, companies also need to be able to evaluate their competitive positions. This takes the form of a SWOT analysis, which I'll go over in more detail in a few slides. Goal setting, those are typically tied to the actual mission of the company. They're derived directly from the firm's mission statement. And the next, creating strategies, obviously implementing those strategies and evaluating the results, right? And incorporating those lessons. This is one of the most important things. Failure is not always bad if you can learn from it, right? I think that a lot of times we're so paralyzed by our own failure that we fail to act. And really, if you necessarily, if an outcome doesn't necessarily go your way, if you learn from it and adapt to that and learn what to do the next time around, then that's something that's going to be beneficial for you, even if there are short-term negative results, right? 
So let's go into a couple missions. Um, there are a couple mission statements here from various companies here. Now, obviously, these kind of define an organization's purpose, its values, goals, how it conducts business, who it serves. And some mission statements are more uh, informational than others, right? Some are just kind of fun. Some don't really tell you a whole lot, but some go into a great amount of detail, right? Let's talk about Starbucks here, for example, which is the first mission statement on your screen. Starbucks's mission is to inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, in one neighborhood at a time. And when you look at Starbucks, when you go to a Starbucks, when you look at their business model, when you see what they're about, this mission statement really resonates very soundly as a result of that. Starbucks very much wants to be that third uh, area, so to speak, where people engage in and communicate and develop relationships, right? We have our home, obviously, which is our primary area that we socialize with people and develop relationships with. There's work where we spend probably, maybe arguably for some of us, a majority of our time and have obviously an opportunity to interact with coworkers and develop relationships there. Starbucks wants to be that third area, where you're, you're going to hang out with friends and all those different types of things and to talk and meet people that you haven't before and business meetings and all, all those other uh, sorts of things there. And so that's Starbucks what they want to do, right? They don't just sell coffee, so to speak. They're in the business of relationships, which is what they'll say. I'm going to skip down here to Google real quick. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. When you evaluate Google's decision to pull their search engine out of China specifically, you, know, you look at their mission statement and you see that they want to make the world's information, take it, organize it, and make it universally accessible and useful. Would it have been useful if they had to censor their search results in China? For Google, they argue that it would not be useful because once again, you're tailoring what people are going to see as far as information. And so that wasn't consistent with their particular mission. And as a result, they did not want to do business in that particular area of the world. Now, China has a huge population, as we know, very more Internet users, uh, arguably, than the U.S. And so it's a huge opportunity. And so obviously, it's a business decision that Google made that can negatively impact them, just given the level of opportunity in that part of the world. All right, when you're evaluating your competitive position, what you do is a SWOT analysis, and that's an acronym. So S stands for strengths, W stands for weaknesses, O stands for opportunities, and T stands for threats. And this is a, uh, a level of analysis that you conduct both on yourself and on the external market, okay? Now, the strengths and weaknesses part is basically concerned internally, meaning you focus on yourself inside. What are your strengths? What are things that you do that no one else can replicate? Maybe you have a, a great uh, training program or you have a particular... Uh, benefits program that no one can really match, so to speak. Uh, you have companies like SAS, which is a software development company out of uh, North Carolina somewhere, and they're primarily involved in basically getting high qualified applicants to their organization. And SAS offers a lot of different attractive benefits. Uh, they have on site daycares, health spas. You can take some time off and actually play a little bit of golf, you know, in the middle of your shift. They have dry cleanings on house, you know, relaxed dress code. You can play frisbee outside, you know, a lot of different things. And what those do is they'll give them the ability to attract the, the best people. Right. And if you have the best qualified applicants applying, that means that you can get the most highly skilled workers. Right. You can be more selective. It's like Google. Google gets hundreds of thousands of applicants. And so that allows them to get the best people on there. You have people that used to work for NASA that work for Google, obviously very educated and intelligent type people. And so that could be a strength. Right. Maybe you have the most highly qualified employees, the high, most highly skilled employees that are in your particular industry. That is a definite strength because that is difficult to replicate. It's a process that takes uh, a little bit of time to do. Your brand name can be of a particular strength, right? If you have a brand name such as Disney, which the, the name of Disney in, immediately conjures up thoughts and, and happiness and the you know happiest place on earth and all those different types of things. You know, McDonald's, strong brand recognition, Coca-Cola, strong, strong brand recognition. 
Your management team, right? If you have a strong team of management with a great complement of skills, proven track record of success, and even costs can be a potential strength. Uh, weaknesses. These are things that obviously your company does not do well. It's important to identify your weaknesses. You don't want to necessarily brush them off to the side and say we're not going to worry about them because competitors can exploit your weaknesses. And you can, if you work on these things, turn your weaknesses ultimately into strengths or at least improve them so it's not so much of kind of a, a weak chain in the uh, a weak link in the chain, so to speak. Um, so there be a number of things can be weaknesses, obviously. Poor location can be one. You know, maybe you're just so far off the beaten path if you're a retailer that nobody can even get to you unless they're lost and get there by accident. Obviously, a lack of capital or financial resources can be an extreme weakness as well. And then low employee satisfaction, all right? If employees are not happy, there's a lot of research that supports that happy workers are more productive. And so if they're not necessarily happy, are they going to be productive? Do you have high attrition rates? Are you constantly having to you know, hire employees to actually replace the ones that left? That represents a cost and a huge time commitment as well because you have to you know, put out... Uh, find a way for them to know about the job and postings and things. You have to interview them, go through the selection process, and then train them after all that. So a huge time and commitment as, as well as from a financial commitment as well. Now, opportunities are and threats are external. These, you're evaluating potential opportunities that your firm has out in the external market, right? Um, a big one, especially in the Central Valley, is as we begin to shift towards a Hispanic majority, that presents a great deal of opportunity for businesses to cater towards that Hispanic demographic, right? We're seeing a lot more advertisements, a lot more television stations open up with Hispanic programming. You're seeing uh, Hispanic-run media like Univision locate in Fresno and, and have their offices here because they realize it's a huge and it's a growing market. So that represents an opportunity for businesses to expand to, right? If there's high consumer demand in a particular area, if there's a foreign market, that is potential for growth, right? India is a foreign market right now that has some high growth potential as well as China. Because India, you're dealing with 1.3 billion people, which is like four times the size of the U.S. population, but they're crammed in a much tighter space. And so that's a lot of people. And arguably their standard of living, their income is not nearly as high as the U.S., but just by sheer numbers, that's a great opportunity there. Uh, threats. Threats are potential things that could happen outside in the external environment that can negatively impact your firm, right? A new competitor coming in, the economy, right? The most recent recession obviously is a threat. These things you cannot affect, right? But if you can predict them, if you can prepare for them, then you may be more able to kind of weather the storm and view it as an opportunity, right? New government regulation, obviously, that can potentially impose more strict standards on your company, which costs more money, obviously, can also be another example of a threat. Let's talk about goals. Uh, goals are extremely important. Obviously, we all have individual goals, and companies, much like individuals, have their own set of goals as well. Uh, goals should follow some very specific criteria when actually setting them to increase the overall success or potential success of the goal setting process. And first, it's important to be specific. Um, there's an acronym for goal setting which you might be familiar with, and that's SMART goals. Uh, S being specific, M being measurable, A being attainable, R being relevant, and T being time bound. And although there's different terminology on this particular slide, the same type of, of reasoning and the same type of understanding holds true. Um, so specific, it's important that you set very, very specific goals. You know, let's say that you want to lose weight. It's after the new year, uh, potentially in this scenario. And, you know, obviously you want to get in shape and so does everyone else and all those different types of things. And you don't want to necessarily get to the end of January and then quit like a lot of people do and have to do the whole thing over next year. So you want to set a goal. If I set a goal and I said, I want to lose weight, would that be successful? It wouldn't, right? Because, okay, I want to lose weight. So say I lose half a pound. Is that really a good measure of success? It's not. You have no idea when you've essentially arrived, so to speak, and accomplished your goal. So I wanted to use 15 pounds. 
is a specific goal. It gives me something to shoot for. But if I just want to lose weight, I mean, geez, my weight fluctuates like two to three pounds a day. I mean, it doesn't really, that doesn't really help, right? If I weigh myself on a, at a good time, then, hey, I already, I already lost two pounds. I guess I'm done. I lost some weight. So you, it's important to be successful, right? If you're trying to attain uh, a certain sales level, be specific. I don't want to sell more. I want to sell $15,000 more is much more specific. Okay, uh, measurable. It has to be quantifiable. In my previous example, my goal wasn't specific or measurable. I want to lose weight. You have to be able to measure what success looks like. If you're talking with numbers, it's much easier because you have something to shoot for. Okay, uh, realistic obviously has to do with attainability, which is that third acronym or that third letter in the acronym here. It needs to be relevant or it needs to be realistic, I should say, or attainable. And you don't want to set a goal that is so high and lofty that it's extremely demotivating. You know, we've all worked for supervisors that have set just unrealistic expectations for us. And we knew off the bat that there's no way that you can possibly ever attain that. And so how motivated were you to try? You weren't really. Because you knew that there wasn't a shot in you know, anything that you could possibly ever reach that particular goal. Goals, on the other hand, should be attainable but challenging. right? There's a term called stretch goals. It's designed to stretch us to make us try even more so, but it should be something that is realistic. Uh, relevant, which you don't see here on your screen, just means the goal should apply to what you're trying to accomplish ultimately, right? If you're a company, your goals should be somewhat in line with your overall mission. It has to be relevant to what you're trying to accomplish. And lastly, it must be time bound, right? We can't just go on forever. I can't have a goal to lose 15 pounds until the end of time. It needs to be a specific start and end date, right? So if I want to lose 15 pounds by you know, January 31st or whatever date it is that you set. There needs to be a cutoff date because that's going to light a fire under you because you know you don't have all day to get going. So let's look at some examples of goals here um, just so you get kind of a better idea on what it is that I'm talking about here. Um, so some examples of goals, uh, there's obviously two columns here, you know, one being a weak goal, one being a powerful or strong goal, um, which you'll kind of get the idea of on, on what the difference between the two is. So, you know, the first example, become more innovative. You know, I don't really even know what that is, right? How do you know when I become more innovative? How do you know when you're done, when you need to try more? Right? Maybe a, a stronger goal could be introduce one new product each quarter for the next three years. Right? It's specific. It's measurable. It's attainable. It's relevant Right, because I would need to produce new products if I'm a company, if I'm going to stay competitive. And it's also time bound. Right? I have three years ultimately and I'm producing one each quarter for the next three years. So I have to know that every quarter a new product needs to come out. Another weak goal, reduce delinquent accounts. Okay. Maybe I lose one. Is that good? Is that really something that we're trying to accomplish? Probably not. Maybe it's reduced delinquent accounts to no more than 1% of the total by the next quarter. Not only is it specific, it's measurable, I can quantify it, it's attainable, relevant obviously, and obviously time bound. You have one quarter to get that done. And then lastly, increase market share. Okay, once again, I'm going to increase market share. I'm up 0.02%. This is great. Granted that my competitors jumped 7%, but I went up, so it must be good. Instead, more specifically, you can say become the number one or number two brand in each market where we compete by the end of 2012. Now, depending upon where you're at, that may not be attainable, right? If you're like a no nobody and you, you barely even started producing your product, you're in the technology sector where there's you know Apple and all those different companies that are hugely successful already, maybe coming number one or number two isn't attainable. Maybe it is if you're the number three or number four, kind of in the mix, so to speak. Now, so it's important that you be specific with these types of things. One last thing I'll say about goal setting, it's important to have them written down. Goals that are written down are tangible for us. They're concrete. It's on paper. It's real. If it's just in your mind somewhere, then it's not real. It's a thought. It's an idea. But the second that you put it down on a piece of paper, it becomes very real. And your motivation for attaining it increases very much so. All right, the last thing I want to talk about here is the controlling aspect. Um, obviously, we went through the planning process specifically. and We want to talk a little bit more about 
control uh, specifically, and we'll spend some time in subsequent lectures going over the organization piece, how businesses organize themselves, and ultimately that leading piece, which are the two center ac letters of the acronym, planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Now, we want to talk about control right here, and controlling is making sure that everything works properly, right? You need to make sure, you need to have some system in place to evaluate whether or not you were successful. This involves monitoring your company's performance to make sure the goals are achieved, right? We don't want to just set the goals and then continue to wander aimlessly through the woods in hopes that we somehow attain the goals, but never know if we actually do. So you have to have a system in place to monitor performance, okay? First, this involves establishing clear performance standards. Right? It's important that when you're an employee and you have a position and your employer tells you this is what I want to, you to obtain, that it's clear so you know what the hurdle is, right? You know how you're going to be measured. You know at the end of the year when we sit down and do your performance review what I'm going to evaluate you based off of. If there isn't clear performance standards in place, then you're, at the end of the year, you're not going to have the ability to say, yes, we achieved that or no, we didn't. If your goals aren't specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound, you're not going to be able to do that. The second thing that you do is you actually have to measure the performance, right? We've established the measures, the benchmarks that you need to attain to or need to strive towards. And now we're going to measure what your performance was compared to the actual standard. Was it good? Was it bad? You know, did you achieve more so or less than? And that last step is taking corrective action, right? We have to determine if the standards were met or not. And depending upon if they were met or not, in number two, then we have to react accordingly. And there are a couple different things we can do, obviously. You know, we can give praise and recognition or raises or bonuses if somebody did achieve their standards. If they don't, we can always... You know, give them a formal write-up, like a corrective action sort of thing on paper, goes in their file. They can be fired ultimately, which that usually is a last resort. There are all different types of things we can do. Now, what I will challenge you to think about, especially if you're in a managerial role or are someday going to be or would like to be, is to consider what external factors are affecting your employee's ability to achieve their results. Right? If you have a majority of your employees and they're always reaching their goals and their benchmarks, it may not necessarily be good. Maybe the goals are too easy. But if you have a majority of employees that are not receiving their goals, then maybe you need to look at things that could be negatively affecting their ability to meet those goals. Maybe we're looking at the environment. Maybe it's in a recession. Right? People aren't spending money. Maybe you sell vacations. And in recessions, people are like, well, I don't want to spend get book a vacation. I don't know if I can pay my mortgage next month. Why am I going to book a cruise? And so those are things outside that that affect your ability, your employee's ability to achieve their goals. So is it okay to hold them responsible to things that are outside of their control? Now, if you have a majority of your employees reaching goals and one employee who's consistently not, then obviously that leads you to believe that they are attainable and there is somewhat of an issue going on with this other employee who isn't necessarily able to achieve those particular goals. So do keep in mind the consistency there. You know, what in the external environment is producing this? You know, seldomly is our own performance subject to our own performance. There are many other things that need to be taken into account when evaluating an employee objectively and successfully. All right. Thank you very much for listening and being a part here. I really do appreciate it. I try to touch on some of the more major issues, obviously related to management. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to try and find me and let me know. Um, otherwise, make sure that you're reading the textbook. Obviously, there's a lot more information in there that you can refer to. Uh, to go ahead and kind of learn these concepts. My goal here is to kind of hit some of the major points as well. So thank you for, thank you for joining and have a great week.